If you guys kept on talking, I wouldn't start. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would. All right, so um, we got a good start last time talking about enzymes and um, introduced the concepts of VMAX, KCAT, and KM. I'm going to say some more about KM uh, to start. Um, but I want to say one more thing about VMAX also. So VMAX isn't something that we totally throw away because in order for us to determine KCAT, we have to determine VMAX. So it's important to remember that. Okay? We have to determine VMAX in order to determine KCAT. VMAX is a situation, and I, did, I gave you the analogy, but I didn't really finish it last time. VMAX is a situation where the enzyme is saturated with substrate. Saturated, meaning that as soon as the uh, enzyme finishes catalyzing a reaction on one molecule and releases its product, another one is there and ready to um, react, or to, to, I'm sorry, to bind to the enzyme so that it can react. All right? So saturation of, the saturation of the enzyme by the substrate is a very, very important um, idea. And so that happens at a certain concentration. And above that concentration, it doesn't matter how much more substrate we add, it's still going to be saturated. Okay? So the analogy, of course, was the, the, the factory that's making the cars, as long as it's got all the parts that it ever needs, you know, and it got them in big supply, adding more parts isn't going to make anything go any faster. Okay? So that's, that's um, important to keep in mind. All right. Well, last time I started talking about KM. And KM came from uh, this plot here, where we see uh, the plot of VMAX. And another thing we see VMAX is very useful for is determination of KM. So KM, I told you at the time, or when I finished the lecture last time, KM is a measure of the affinity of an enzyme for its substrate. Okay? So it's a measure of the affinity of an enzyme for its substrate. And we want to note that affinity, because that tells us something about the way in which the substrate binds, how the enzyme is set up for it, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Well, I noted that if we determine the concentration at Vmax, then we would have um, uh, no good measure of affinity because Vmax occurs, of course, at a very high concentration. And it doesn't really tell us very much. Once we get to that high concentration, if we add, we measure at a higher concentration, it's still just Vmax. Okay? So that's important to understand. Right? I think I said last time, and somebody asked me at the very end, you know, I, I said something to the effect that, well, any concentration can give us Vmax. What I meant was any concentration above this high concentration will give us Vmax. Of course, we don't get Vmax down in this range because um, we're below Vmax, obviously, down in here. But we get up in here, every concentration above that is going to give us Vmax because we're saturated with substrate. So instead of measuring the substrate concentration at Vmax, which tells us really nothing, we're much more interested in the substrate concentration that gives us Vmax over 2. All right? So that turns out to be very valuable for us. And um, it gives us this, uh, this quantity Km. Now, one of the big misconceptions I find that students have when I talk to them about that is they think that Km equals Vmax over 2. Now, I find this rather baffling because this graph says, here's Km, and here's Vmax over 2. Right? Now, those two points are not the same thing. <laughs> All right? This is a velocity. This is a substrate concentration. So what confuses them is when I say that Vmax is the substrate concentration that gives Vmax. I'm, I'm sorry, the Km is the substrate concentration that gives Vmax over 2. That's where they get confused. All right? But notice, those two points are definitely not the same point. So if you say Vmax equals Km over 2, you are definitely wrong. And that happens on every exam almost every time. Somebody will, somebody will say that. And it's like, well, get, you know, wake up and smell the coffee here. These are not the same thing. As I noted last time, the higher the Km value for an enzyme, the lower the affinity the enzyme has for its substrate. Now, I'm going to explain that to you in terms that I hope make some sense for you. All right? Let's imagine I have two enzymes that catalyze identical reactions. Identical reactions. One, uh, one makes, uh, it's, um, has a Km of the value that you see here. And one has a value of Km that's over here. Right? So if the Km is over here to the right, 
that would mean that the Vmax over 2 is to the right. So the Vmax over 2 would be way over here somewhere. And what that's telling us is that it takes more substrate to get to the same velocity. More substrate to get to the same velocity. That's what a higher Km corresponds to. So if it takes more substrate to get to the same velocity, why does it take more substrate? Because the substrate has to beat on the enzyme's head to get the enzyme to bind to it, meaning that the enzyme doesn't have a high affinity for it. So high Km means low affinity. Low Km means high affinity. Question. Yes, question. Are the KMs and Vmax constant for each enzyme? As I said last time, Vmax is not a constant for an enzyme. Vmax depends upon the quantity of enzyme that you use. KM is a constant for an enzyme given a, given a reasonable set of conditions. Yes. Okay? So Kcat is a constant for an enzyme. Vmax is not a constant for an enzyme. Vmax depends on the amount of, of enzyme that we use in a reaction. Yes? Good question. Are these measurements taken at the beginning of a reaction? The answer is yes. We're interested in measuring these velocities early. Because if we don't measure velocities early, what happens is we start accumulating product. And when we accumulate product, we start favoring the reverse reaction, meaning that we're going to see a lower velocity, even though it's not really a lower velocity. Okay? When, this, when the product starts going back to substrate, it will look like, well, the velocity is lower, but it's not because we're interested in what's making product. But if product starts disappearing, it's going to look like there's not as much product. Right? So we make those measurements early. We make them fairly quick. All right? We want them quick so we get that initial, what's called initial velocity. And that initial velocity is important because it's before the amount of substrate has a chance to build up. OK? I see another hand up here. Yeah. So Vmax over 2, the substrate concentration that gives Vmax over 2 is the Km. Right? The substrate concentration that gives Vmax over 2 is the Km. That means Km is a substrate concentration. Get that in your head. It's not a velocity. OK? Yes? Her question is, if you, if you, if you uh, re don't remove all the, oh, say, 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 say the question again, well, I'm sorry. Would you even be able to get to Vmax if you're not removing the products and it's going? Okay, so, oh, okay. so, so her question is, if you don't remove the products, you're not going to get to Vmax. <laughs> but that's why we measure initial velocity. But then do we just extrapolate from the graph of initial velocity? No, initial, th these, are all the initial velo these are all the initial velocities. So by measuring initial velocities, that's the highest velocity we're going to see. If we wait until we get to equilibrium, we'll have zero velocity because no change is happening. So we have to measure initial velocities in order to have a chance to even get, get up to Vmax. So it's initial that actually this bails us out. Yes? Is Vmax then just kind of a um, value that is necessarily ever reached? Is Vmax essentially a value that is never reached? Well, as you see this curve, this is a hyperbolic plot. This hyperbolic plot actually will get infinitely close to that line, but it won't actually reach that line. Yes? Did I answer your question OK? Oh, OK. <laughs> Thank you for asking the question then. OK. Other questions? OK, so these concepts really tell us a lot about enzymes. And we're, we're going to use these concepts as we move forward. And we'll see how they uh, play out when we have things like enzyme inhibition, which is how drugs work and things like that. So that understanding these concepts is really important for us to understand something about enzymes and what they do. OK. Um, that, I won't go through that. All right. So um, we've learned then about KM, about KCAT, and about VMAX. And um, I want to uh, tell you something else that we consider about enzyme kinetics that may look like it's making it more complicated, but it's done actually to make uh, understanding of enzyme kinetics more simple. And it's something that's called a lineweaver burke plot. It's also something that's called a double reciprocal plot. All right? So let me show you what that looks like, and then we'll talk about it. All right? Here's a lineweaver burke plot. Now, earlier we did an experiment. We had 20 tubes, 
20 different amounts of substrate, same amount of enzymes, same amount of time, and so forth. And we measure the rate of pr product formation as a function of time. All right? And we, got, we, we took that data, we plotted the velocity versus substrate concentration, we got this nice hyperbolic uh, plot that, that, that came with that enzyme. Okay? Well, you saw when we looked at that last plot that, well, if I were to eyeball where the Vmax is, well, I might eyeball it here, I might eyeball it here, I might eyeball it up here, okay? And what I'm basically doing is eyeballing it. And we don't like eyeballing things when we're uh, trying to measure things precisely, okay? So eyeballing will lead us to some difficulty, some problem. So instead of plotting that data on a V versus S plot, we plot it on something called a double reciprocal plot. So instead of V, we take one over the velocity. And by the way, VO just simply means initial velocity. That's all that is. All right? So we're, we're already doing a initial velocities. 1 over V versus 1 over the substrate concentration. So we take the values that we had before, exact same data. We take the reciprocals of those. And when we plot them, we discover that they make a very nice straight line. Very nice straight line. Well, straight lines are things I can work with really readily because I can draw that line through those points. And that line will, of course, go into areas where it's even negative on here. And I can see something about um, some important parameters. The beauty of this straight line is if I look at where it crosses these two axes, the numerical value of those tells me something very useful. The place where the line crosses the x-axis, I'm sorry, the y-axis, is known as 1 over Vmax. So now I've got a precise way of saying what the value of Vmax is. The place where it crosses the x-axis is minus 1 over Km. So I didn't have to do any guesses. I didn't have to do anything. I got precise values now for Vmax and for Km. So if this value that I had for Km turned out to, if this value was, was 4, I'm sorry, was minus 4 according to this plot, then the value of Km would be, would, would be uh, 1 fourth. Right? Because I'd take 1 minus 1 over that, and I would have it. So minus 1 over minus 4 would equal 1 fourth. Right? All right. So Km and Vmax turn out to be very, very easy for me to calculate as a result of that. Now, let me tell you something that you're not going to do on an exam. You'll do it in some of the pro practice problems that I put out, but you're not going to do it on an exam. And that is, I'm not going to give you a bunch of data and say, let's plot this data. All right? Because that's a waste of your time. It's a waste of our time in grading it and so forth. And presumably, you learned how to graph things way back when you took um, college algebra. Right? So we're not going to be doing that. But I think that you should be familiar with what these graphs look like and how to interpret them. That's something that's very reasonable to expect of you. Okay? Now you say, well, it's very straightforward. It's a straight line, right? Well, okay, it's a straight line, and it's a straight line that has some important intercepts. It's a straight line that we get by manipulating the data in a certain way. All right? But this straight line turns out to also tell us something about enzyme inhibition uh, in just a little bit. So we're going to see how enzymes get inhibited, and these types of plots will be very, very useful for us in understanding enzyme inhibition. So. Um, I'll leave that uh, for the next coming attraction. Questions on this before I move forward? You're stunned to silence. Yes? I was How did I graph this? I took all the values I had before, and I took the reciprocals of them. So I had velocities, I took the reciprocal of velocity. I had substrate concentrations, I took the reciprocal of the substrate concentrations, and then I plotted them on this plot. That's, what the, that's where this data came from. Okay? I could take, you know, multiply each one by 20. I have another plot, right? All, all these are manipulations that I'm doing, but this manipulation was taking reciprocals of those, and the reason I took those reciprocals was they gave me a straight line. And that straight line is very useful. Okay? Yes? Yeah. No, because this is always going to be in the negative range. This is the KM. Oh. So this is always going to come out as a negative, which is why we always have a negative 1 over KM. 
Well, it'd be impossible for you to have a negative KM because it's impossible for me to have a negative substrate concentration. So that's what I'm saying. It will always come out to a negative number over here, and you take the negative of a negative number and the reciprocal of it, it's going to be a positive number. You're always going to have that, right? Okay. All right. So um, let's see. What else can I say here? Any, any other questions? Okay. Well, um, let's uh, take this and do some other things with it. So um, here are some KM values of some enzymes. And what we see is that enzymes can vary considerably in their KM values, meaning that these enzymes can have considerably different affinities for their substrates. This guy up here, uh, chymotrypsin, has a KM value of 5,000 micromolar. That's a substrate concentration, 5,000 micromolar. And that tells us that this has a relatively low affinity for its substrate. The enzyme, this enzyme has a relatively low affinity for its substrate. Okay? This guy down here, arginine tRNA synthetase, has a relatively high affinity for its substrate, 0 0.4 micromolar. Okay? So those that range that we see there tells us that these enzymes have quite varying affinities for their substrates. Okay. Here's some turnover numbers. I showed you some of those before. Carbonic anhydrase, 600,000 to a million, depends on who does, who does the numbers, but that's basically what a carbonic anhydrase has. Now, the reason I show you both of those numbers is because of a concept that's really interesting and something that I think students generally find pretty cool. If I were to say to you, what is a perfect enzyme, okay, given what we've learned already, I would say, well, let's think about its affinity, and let's think about its velocity, its, 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 its kcat, okay? So we think about its kcat, and we think about its affinity. What would a perfect enzyme have? Would it have a low or a high velocity? A high velocity, right? Because you want that enzyme to get out there and do its thing. Would it have a high affinity for its substrate or a low affinity for its substrate? It would have a high affinity for its substrate. So it wouldn't take very much substrate to get to half V max, right? Well, it turns out that if we say, well, are there enzymes that, you know, that really give this example, it turns out that there are. And the way what we do is we take the value of kcat and we divide it by the km. And no, that's not a calculation you're going to do. I'm just telling you how, this, how we make this determination, okay? We take the kcat for an enzyme and we divide it by its km. And when we do that for a whole bunch of enzymes, we discover something really interesting. Some enzymes have a relatively low ratio, meaning they're not very um, um, perfect because that means they don't have a high velocity and a low km. A high velocity and a low km is going to give us a very big number. But then when we look at a bunch of other enzymes, we discover that they sort of go up and then they reach a peak and they don't go any higher. That ratio of kcat to km doesn't change for different enzymes, okay? So that is, there's a maximum that it reaches, and it doesn't get any higher, all right? Well, it turns out that those that have that optimally high ratio are what we call perfect enzymes. And there's a very good reason, all right? They can't get that ratio any larger because the limiting factor for them is not how well they work, it's how well the substrate can diffuse through water. Water becomes the limiting um, uh, uh, material for the reaction to occur. And we call them perfect because they literally are perfect. If we make any mutation in those enzymes, they will give a kcat over km that's less than the perfect one. So they're optimally uh, fast, they're optimally efficient, they're optimally high affinity for their substrates, and you're probably sitting there thinking, well, why aren't all enzymes perfect? Because why hasn't nature evolved this perfectness into every enzyme? And the answer is because it would be one of the worst things that nature could do. How come everybody doesn't have an Indy speed car to drive to Fred Meyer. <laughs>
Well, A, it would be kind of a ridiculous use of an Indy speed car, but if they drove at the rates that they drove on the Indy 500 over to Fred Meyer, we would have, shall we say, crashes along the way. If we had every enzyme perfect, and enzymes were making millions of molecules of product per second, okay, and it didn't take very much to get to that point, we could imagine that enzymes might be producing things faster than the cell could use them. It might be making things that the cell didn't want too much of something is a bad thing. It might be using up substrate that the cell could use for something else. So it turns out that relatively few enzymes are perfect. Some are. We'll talk about a couple of them this term. Some are perfect enzymes. But most enzymes are not perfect because if they were perfect, as I said, we would have problems. And those problems we don't want to have to deal with. We're going to see that regulating and controlling enzymes is one of the major things that cells has to do. So a perfect enzyme is really tough to control. We don't want to have perfect enzymes causing problems for us. OK. An example of perfect enzymes are these guys here. All right? If you look at that ratio of KCAT over KM, they're all in the range of about 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th. These guys are all what we would refer to as perfect enzymes. This guy right here on the bottom I like to point out. Okay? This guy on the bottom, we like this enzyme to be perfect because this enzyme removes toxic superoxides from our cells. Superoxides cause oxidative damage and they do nobody any good. If there's one thing we want to get rid of, the instant it is made, it's a superoxide. Well, fortunately, we have a perfect enzyme to do just that. Okay? You guys feel relieved now that you've got a perfect enzyme that's taking care of you? Okay, good. All right. Okay, um, let's see. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the way in which enzyme reactions occur. Okay? Two mechanisms by which enzyme reactions can occur. All right? And actually, the, 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 there's two. There's sort, there's sort of three, but there's really two that's there. All right? So if I think about an enzyme, I described for you guys last time um, the enzyme hexokinase. Hexokinase catalyzes the first reaction of glycolysis, the first reaction of the breakdown of sugar. And as I described to you, it had to bind to two things. It had to bind to an ATP, and it had to bind to a glucose. Okay? Now, that enzyme that binds those two things, we could say, well, does it bind them in a specific order? That is, does it bind the ATP first and then the glucose? Does it bind the glucose first and then the ATP? Or does it not matter? Those are our possibilities, right? So for enzymes that bind to multiple substrates, there are two different mechanisms that they can use. One is called ordered, where they start out with the specific binding of one substrate, then the other substrate, and finally the formation of product. Ordered means just that, that the binding is of a specific order. On the other hand, enzymes like hexokinase don't have a specific order. Okay? This, here's another example. I'll talk about this in a minute. Okay? They don't have a specific order. Binding of one or the binding of the other one all right, is necessary, but it doesn't matter which order in which they're bound. All right? Now, we've been talking about the flexibility of enzymes. The flexibility of enzymes. All right? And when we talk about the flexibility of enzymes, it means I need to, to bring up another uh, topic to, to talk about with respect to enzymes, and this is mechanism. And these mechanisms tie into what I'm talking about here, but I'm going to distract you from up here for a moment while I talk about mechanism. Okay? Is that a question, or is that just resting your head? Okay. <laughs> All right. There's two different ways we can think about enzymes. One, you probably learned in basic um, high school biology classes, and probably even maybe even your college biology classes, and that is... You've heard the expression that an enzyme fits its substrate like a lock fits a key, right? Okay. Well, it turns out that that mechanism that we talk about is very, very popular, and it's very, very discussed, and it's very, very wrong. Okay. 
So it's true that enzymes do fit their substrates, like a lock fits a key. But that mechanism doesn't tell us anything about how an enzyme works. It tells us zero about how an enzyme works. What it says is the enzyme fits its substrate like a lock fits a key, and then magic happens, and then we get a product. All right? Well, people realize this after a while. That, by the way, that's called the Fisher model, F-I-S-C-H-E-R, Fisher. All right. The Fisher model um, is very good at explaining how an enzyme binds to a specific substrate, but not very good about telling us how an enzyme works. Well, you guys have already learned how an enzyme works. The, what you've learned is what we call the induced fit model. The induced fit model says, A, enzymes are flexible, and B, the binding of the substrate changes the enzyme very transiently. And it's that change in the enzyme that allows it to catalyze the reaction. That's a lot of words for the following sentence. The following sentence says that not only does an enzyme change a substrate, but a substrate also changes an enzyme transiently. Why transiently? Well, if it changed it permanently, the enzyme would work exactly one time. After the reaction is done, the enzyme goes back to its original state. Now, why do I tell you that with respect to what I've put on the screen? Okay. Well, let's think about the two models that I've given to you. Let's talk about this one. Uh, let's talk about the other one first, which is the ordered binding. What does ordered binding tell us? It says that they have to bind, the substrates have to bind in a specific order. One has to bind before the other one can bind. What does that tell you about what I just told you about enzyme flexibility? Well, no, it says it is very flexible. Okay? What it says is that the binding of the first one causes a shape change in the enzyme such that the second one can bind. And if it doesn't bind, then the second one can't bind at all. Right? So what the ordered binding tells us is that the um, um, induced fit model, which I've just described to you, is correct. That is, that the enzyme is flexible and that that flexibility is important for it to function. Now, well, you say, well, what about the ones that aren't ordered? What, what do you say about those, right? Well, what I say about those is that what matters is for them both to be bound. We talked about binding of ATP, binding of the glucose, and then the jaws clamp down. All right? It still says it's flexible, but the flexibility isn't related to the binding of a substrate. It's related to the action of the enzyme. Okay? That's pretty cool. Okay. So, um, as I said, this was a reaction. We'll actually talk about it um, later. I'm not going to talk about it here. But this enzyme is very important in our muscles. That allows our muscles uh, to have energy when we're doing things like sprinting. Okay? And we'll, we'll talk about this later. But this is a reaction that doesn't require any specific order in which the substrates to be bound. Okay. Now, I said that there's a third model that's sort of there. What's the deal with it? Okay? Well, the third model that's there is sort of an example of a single substrate binding. It's not even really like a double substrate, but you'll think about it that way. Okay? And it's something called double displacement. So double displacement is yet another mechanism for enzymes to work, but it's odd in that the enzyme is being changed between the bindings of the two substrates. What does that mean? Well, let's look at a double displacement reaction. All right. Here's a reaction that's commonly a, a very common example of double displacement. And by the way, double displacement is also called ping pong. We'll talk about ping pong mechanisms. All right. Here's a reaction in which aspartic acid, which is an amino acid, binds to an enzyme. Alpha ketoglutarate binds to an enzyme, and the products are oxaloacetate and glutamate. Well, what's going on here? Well, this is a very simple thing on the surface. On the surface, what's happening is this guy, aspartate, has an amine group, and this alpha ketoglutarate has a double bonded oxygen. And these two are just swapping positions because over here, 
This guy now has the oxygen, and this guy has the amine group. They've swapped positions. The only question is, well, how did they swap positions? This is where the enzyme played an intermediate role in the process. The enzyme starts out, and it says, oh, I've just bound to an aspartate. I'm going to take what I have on me, which happens to be an oxygen, and I'm going to put an oxygen in place of that amine, and I'm going to take that amine. The amine now has, I'm sorry, the, the, no, the enzyme now has an amine on it, and it binds to an alpha ketoglutarate and says, oh, look, you've got an oxygen. I'll swap the oxygen for the amine I have, and now I've got an oxygen again. And then it goes and it binds another aspartate and repeats the process. The enzyme is changing between two states, a state in which it has oxygen or a state in which it has an amine. Which one it has determines which one of these that it binds to. If it has an oxygen, it's going to bind to an amine. If it has an amine, it's going to bind to one that has an oxygen. The enzyme is literally doing, that's where the ping pong comes from, this state to that state to this state to that state to this state to that state. It's going back and forth. Each time, it's only binding one substrate. Make sense? If so, you'll be the first class I've ever said that got that right on the first time. Questions about that? Yes? Um, can this particular amine have any different two groups, or will it always be an amine and a... Can this enzyme have any different groups besides that? The answer is, for this class of reactions, it'll always be an amine or an oxygen. There are other enzymes that use ping-pong mechanisms that have their own ping-pong things, but for a given enzyme, they'll always have the, the, the two uh, of, of the specific thing. Yes? What happens to the substrate in the intermediate stage when it's had, like, oxygen Okay. So her question is, what happens to the substrate in the intermediate state? You'll notice I said when I started that the enzyme had an oxygen. So it has swapped the oxygen for this. So there's not a, a place where it releases as an intermediate. So it's swapping it while it's on the enzyme. Then the enzyme releases it as this guy. Make sense? Good question. Yes? How does it get started? How does it get started? Well, that's a good question. It had to get started by binding to something, right? So the enzyme just started out with an oxygen. That's all we have to worry about. Okay. That's all we have to worry about. Yeah? So if it has an amine, it can only bind to alpha right? That's correct. Wouldn't it only go in one direction No, because it could, bind, it, it could bind this and go backwards. Right? This also has an oxygen. Right? So you see over here, we've always got one that has an oxygen, one that has an amine, one that has an oxygen, one that has an amine. So it can go either direction. What's going to determine the direction it's going to go? Concentration. So if I have a ton of this stuff, all right, and I've got sitting here with an amine, it's going to be much more likely it's going to bind to this and go this direction than it's going to be bind this and go this direction. Yes? What's the two to stop from switching without the enzyme? Like any other reaction, extremely unfavorable um, in terms of kinetics without the enzyme. So it's very, very slow. It wouldn't happen with any appreciable rate. Yes? How does the enzyme take one thing off and put the other one on? That's a mechanism I'm not going to go through here. Um, it is not an unusual chemical reaction, swapping an amine for, for an oxygen like this. Uh, but I won't go through that here. I will talk about enzyme mechanism um, starting um, later this week or next week. But, that, but not with this re reaction. Okay. So, good. Um, ping pong mechanisms are pretty cool, pretty interesting uh, examples. Don't worry about the schematics. The schematics will just simply confuse you. And I think the schematics really don't um, help with the process. Okay. Now, I want to complicate this just a little bit. Um, oh boy, that's what I do, right? That's what I get paid to do. Here's a plot of V versus S for an enzyme. And look at what it looks like. It doesn't look like a hyperbola. It looks like what? It looks kind of like the oxygen binding to hemoglobin, right? 
In oxygen binding to hemoglobin, we saw what's called a sigmoidal plot, which is, means it looks like an S, instead of looking like a hyperbola, which is what the uh, myoglobin binding curve looked like. Is there something similar going on here to what's, what happens in um, um, uh, cooperativity? And the answer is yes, there is sort of. Okay? Enzymes um, also can be multi-subunit, just like hemoglobin versus myoglobin. And the binding of one substrate to an enzyme can change an enzyme so that it favors the binding of others. Kind of like we saw the favoring of the binding of multiple oxygens if we saw one. When we have that phenomenon going on, we have an enzyme that behaves kind of like hemoglobin did. We don't call it cooperative. We call it allosteric. A-L-L-O-S-T-E-R-I-C. Allosteric enzymes behave the way they do because they're multiple subunit. And as, excuse me, as we shall see, they can behave because the substrate changes them. They can also behave because something besides the substrate changes them. And we'll see some examples of that next week. Yes? Well, are there multiple substrates? Well, if there's multiple subunits of an enzyme, you will have multiple substrates as well. Right. Okay. So hopefully that didn't confuse things too much. Well, now I want to turn our attention to something that's a little bit more fun and a little bit more relevant for many of you who are interested in, in medicine, healthcare, and things like that. And this is enzyme inhibition. All right? Enzyme inhibition is really a desired goal of people who design drugs. If we can knock out HIV's uh, enzymes, we can stop HIV from doing anything. All right? So being able to inhibit enzymes is really, really useful for us. And if we can design them selectively so that they only inhibit HIV's enzymes and not other enzymes, the drugs would have essentially no effect on, on, on healthy cells. Okay? Right. So let's uh, think about how we might inhibit an enzyme. All right? Here's um, a couple of examples, all right? We have or two examples, actually three examples, but I'm only going to talk about two of them, all right? In the first case, we have um, an enzyme here that has, has a substrate binding site, and there's that lock and key sort of thing. As I said, the lock and key is good for describing binding, but not for describing catalysis. And there's that enzyme substrate that's bound to the enzyme just as, a, as the key would fit into a lock, all right? What does a drug do? Well, a drug would ideally bind to an enzyme and keep the normal substrate from binding and thereby stop the normal substrate from being converted. It would thus inhibit the enzyme. Okay. Well, that's depicted in this upper right schematic that you see up here. We have a compound that's pink that has the same basic shape as the substrate. And because of that, the enzyme grabs a hold of it just like it would the normal substrate, but it's chemically different. And it's been chemically modified so that the enzyme can't do anything with it. We've just made what I would describe as a competitive inhibitor. It's called a competitive inhibitor because it competes with the substrate for the active site of the enzyme. And by the way, the active site is the place where the reaction occurs. It competes with the substrate for the active site of the enzyme. It competes because it looks like it. All right? Well, that's one way that we could knock out this enzyme. Another way that we could knock out the enzyme is by using something that binds in a different place than the active site. But it causes a shape change in the enzyme so that the substrate no longer fits properly. Now, in this case, the drug that we've just designed binds to a separate site on the enzyme. It's not competing with the substrate because the substrate's still trying to get to the active site, even though the active site itself has been changed. We've just made something that I describe as a non competitive inhibitor. So a competitive inhibitor looks like the, sub, the normal substrate. A non-competitive inhibitor does not look like the normal substrate. 
I'm not going to talk about uncompetitive. It's actually a quite a bit more complicated mechanism, and I'm just going to I'm not going to talk about that in this class. All right. So we're going to be interested in competitive inhibition versus non-competitive inhibition. All right. Well, let's think about what this. Let's think of some examples. Here's an example. Here's um, a compound up on the top that is a substrate that our enzymes that make nucleotides need. Our enzymes that make nucleotides recognize this substrate and they convert it into something that's necessary for making nucleotides. We'll talk about it next term exactly what it is. But this is a normal cellular substrate that is essential for those enzymatic reactions. Here is a competitive inhibitor of the same enzyme. You'll notice it looks an awful lot like that. The difference is that this guy right here, the methotrexate, the enzyme can't do anything with it. It binds to it, but it can't convert it. By the way, I should also point out that in all of these inhibitors we're talking about, these are non-covalent interactions. They're non-covalent. That means it can go in, it can come off. It can go in, it can come off. All right. Methotrexate, and there are some that bind. We'll talk about those separately. But these, all the ones we're talking about right now, the competitive and the non-competitive, are non-covalent. They don't bind permanently. Well, it turns out not binding permanently is important for this. Why is it important? Well, the importance is that um, this making of nucleotides is pretty important for cells to do. All right. When would we want to inhibit nucleotide synthesis? Well, one of the times we might want to inhibit it is when we have a cancer cell. Cancer cells need to make DNA in order to divide. They need to divide more rapidly. If we can knock out the ability of a cancer cell to make nucleotides, we can stop the cancer cell from dividing. The problem is we don't have a good way to get the methotrexate only into cancer cells. So we have to give the drug to the person who gets methotrexate in all of their cells. And if we just let it be there forever, we would kill the person because they would need to make nucleotides for their regular cells to divide. Okay? We give this drug for a short period of time, and because it doesn't bind permanently, we sort of flush it out. The normal cells survive this treatment more readily than cancer cells because they're not dividing so rapidly. It can come out, and our regular enzymes can make the, um, uh, the nucleotides necessary for division. So this is a drug that's given for a short period of time in high doses for people who have an aggressive cancer. That short period of time is enough to kill cancer cells that have to divide very rapidly. Okay? One of the reasons you see people who have loss of hair and appetite loss, vomiting, some very severe reactions to chemotherapy is because they may have had this drug or something like this drug that's harming healthy cells as well as cancer cells. It's hard to distinguish between the two, right? The ideal drug, you're going to knock that cancer down as much as you possibly can. You're probably going to knock down some healthy cells at the same time. Some of those cells, particularly in your intestines, turn out to be very um, rapidly dividing cells as well. So if you aren't rapidly dividing your intestinal cells, you can imagine some real problems associated with your intestines, and people do have that sometimes. But anyway, this turns out to be a very useful competitive inhibitor. Methotrexate is very important in the treatment of some types of cancer. It's used for other things as well. All right. Well, we've got a couple of minutes. I'm going to introduce something here, and then I'm going to come back to it tomorrow. All right. This shows us the kinetics of competitive inhibition. All right. Now, it's a little confusing graph, so I'm going to ask you to focus only on the black line and the top green line. The others we won't worry about here. It's just using different amounts of inhibitor. Let's imagine I take my 20 tubes that I had before. I have the same amount of enzyme. I have the same buffer. I'm going to let the reaction go for the same amount of time, but I have varying amounts of substrate. All right? I want to study reactions in which there's only one variable. The variable that I want is the substrate concentration. So in each tube, I'm going to put the same amount of inhibitor. 
the same amount of inhibitor. So this top one is if I did one concentration of inhibitor, this if I did a different concentration, this if I did a different. But we're going to focus on the top one. Look what's happening as I add the inhibitor. You'll notice that the plot is lower and to the right of the, the reaction, which is black, where there's no inhibitor. If we look at this, what we'll discover is that this green line will eventually reach the black line and it will reach the same Vmax. The same Vmax. By reaching the same Vmax, how does it reach the same Vmax? It's an inhibitor, right? Well, it turns out it's a competitive inhibitor. A competitive inhibitor is competing with the substrate for the active site, but if I get really, really, really high concentrations of substrate, guess who's going to win? The substrate. If I have a million times as much substrate as I have inhibitor, it's a million times more likely that the substrate is going to bind into the active site. And I essentially, it will be as if the inhibitor doesn't even exist. In competitive inhibition, the substrate can outcompete the competitive inhibitor and wins. It happens at high substrate concentrations where the two Vmaxes are the same. On the other hand, if I look at the Km value, is the Km value going to remain the same or is the Km value going to be different? It's moved to the right. Here's maximum, here's 50%. There is the Km for one of them, and the, for the uninhibited. And if for, the, for the green one, it's going to be further to the right. It's going to be a higher Km. In competitive inhibition, Vmax does not change. Km does change. Okay. In competitive inhibition, Vmax does not change. Km increases. Okay. Now, if I were to look at the same thing on a line weaver burt plot, this is what I would see. Here's the uninhibited in black, and here is the inhibitor reaction in red. Notice that the two lines cross right here. Why do you suppose they cross right here? Because Vmax does not change. Vmax has to be the same for the two of them, so they're going to cross at that point. Km increases, which means minus 1 over Km gets closer to 0. These if you were able to look at these two, th this plot, you should be able to say, oh, wow, that's competitive inhibition. Because same, same Vmax, different Km values. Okay? And I'll say a little bit more about it next time, but I'll show you the same plot for non-competitive. And we see the opposite thing. We see the same Km, but we see a change in Vmax. I have a song if you guys would like to finish with a song. We've got time. This is one of the more popular songs. It's called Enzymes. To so an old 60s song called Downtown, it goes, reactions alone could starve your cells to the bone. Thank God we all produce enzymes. Units arranged to make the chemicals change because you always use enzymes. Sometimes mechanisms run like they are at the races. Witness the cacat of the carbonic anhydrases. How do they work? Inside of the active site, it just grabs onto a substrate and squeezes it tight in an enzyme. Catalysis in an enzyme. V versus S in an enzyme. All of this working for you. Enzyme, enzyme. Energy peaks are what an enzyme defeats in its catalysis. Enzymes. Transition state is what an enzyme does great, and you should all know this. Enzymes. Catalytic action won't run wild, don't get hysteric. Cells can throttle pathways with an enzyme allosteric. You know it's true. So when an effector fits, it will just rearrange all the subunits inside an enzyme. 
Flipping from R to T, enzyme, slow catalytically, enzyme, no change in delta G, enzyme, enzyme. You should relax when seeking out the VMAX, though there are many steps, enzymes. Lineweaver Burke can save a scientist's work with just two intercepts, enzymes. Plotting all the data from kinetic exploration lets you match a line into a best fitting equation. Here's what you do. Both axes are inverted, then you can determine Vmax and establish Km for your enzymes. Sterically holding tight enzymes, substrates positioned right enzymes, inside the active site enzymes, enzymes. All right. See you guys on